Hey everyone, this is Kelly, one of your hosts for Success Stories and Private Practice. And today I am joined by Maya Jangarelli Rabot, a licensed clinical social worker in Massachusetts, who has an amazing story of filling up her practice in four months, but there's been some twists and turns since then. And I think so often when we hear success stories, they end at the pinnacle. <laughs> But we want to share a success story that is continuing on through the roller coaster of life. So I'm sure you're going to be inspired. Let's get started. Hey, Maya, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. I want everyone to hear about when you started your private practice. Yeah, so I, I started my private practice in March 2021. Right. Already a year into the pandemic. Right. So why then? Yeah. Um, I'd been a social worker almost 10 years and I had worked managed care, residential, outpatient, finally found my calling in individual therapy, knew I wanted to be a therapist. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to play it safe and work within a group practice because I just never in a million years thought I'd be able to run it myself. I had no concept or frame of reference for that. And, um, after working in the group practice, I realized it was really difficult to be micromanaged by administration. Mm -hmm. They controlled how often I worked, how many clients I saw, which clients I saw, there was no right. niching down. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the pandemic, this may be true for a lot of folks, but you know, I was working from home anyways, you know, everyone, the shutdown happened and we all got sent home and had to do telehealth. And I was like, I can do this on my own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And how long did it take you from that decision to making the leap? Like you're realizing, oh, I can do this on my own, but what does it really take for you to do it on your own? Like feel successful doing it on my own? Well, to start actually being on your own, how long did it take you to make the move? It was pretty, it was relatively quick. I move fast. <laughs> I move fast on things. I am very um, risk tolerant in ah. a lot of ways. And so it was probably only a matter of months before I realized, I mean, I had known about Zinni Me. I had been vetting sort of mm -hmm. the program and doing like consuming all the free material. So I had this kind of, idea of a safety net, which really helped me catapult just mm -hmm. into the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then once you were in the business, how long did it take you to fill up your practice? Well, the first, I, I, I went in two rounds. Okay. <laughs> so I opened my business um, in March, 2021. I think I got my first client on like March 31st. Mm -hmm. And I completely replicated everything wrong that felt wrong that I was doing in the group practice in my private practice. I took anyone and everyone. I mm -hmm. signed up for all the insurance panels. I saw 35 to 40 people a week. Ooh. I saw adults, children, families. Um, and that was about a year mm. that I did that for maybe a little less. And I remember calling my bestie Katie on the phone, who's also a therapist. And I was like, I can't do this. And mm -hmm. she basically forced me to take an emergency like week leave. And mm -hmm. I emailed all my clients and I was like, I'm going to be out for the next week. You can't reach me, but blah, blah, blah. And I just had to completely reassess what I was doing mm -hmm. because it, just, it wasn't working. I wasn't getting paid on time. I was seeing all the wrong people and feeling really resentful. Mm -hmm. I wasn't making enough money. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. We just sent out a survey um, at the end of 2022. And overwhelmingly, the majority of the results, we sent a survey to over <clears throat> 30,000 people. And most people said, I'm successful on the outside. Like I'm seeing all the clients but the money is not enough. I'm not profitable enough to take care of myself and my needs. Um, so 
I, I love that you're sharing this part of your journey because so many people equate busy with success. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah. on the outside, somebody would have been like, Maya's killing it in practice. And they were, I was getting so much positive feedback. <laughs> I, <laughs> and we, I was dying inside. <laughs> we're praising each other for killing our souls. Right. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So you took the week off and what happened in that week? I took the week off. And within that week, I realized I needed to cut back and change. The first step I made was stop seeing kids. I had seen kids my entire career. I loved it. I love children. I love working with children. And it's too much for me. Mm -hmm. It hits that vicarious trauma nerve Mm -hmm. too hard, especially having after having my own child. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first thing that I cut out was no more kids. And I referred all those kids out. And then the next step I made was reevaluating my schedule. And that was a free, I had had a little bit of the taste of Zinni Me of how to do a little bit of that. And that's what inspired me. And so I cut back to a schedule. I think this was in January, 2022, um, that really allowed me to be with my son Mm-hmm. in kindergarten um at the time preschool and um just have more space and time to to just be with myself and be with my family mm-hmm. and what happened to the business when you started making those cuts I started liking the business again like I started feeling more mm-hmm. confident in the decision of even opening um I think the next step I made was, really vetting who I was seeing. So being much more intentional about the clients that I was choosing to work with, Mm -hmm. um, hadn't niched down at that point yet. Um, and then I made the probably biggest decision of my practice, which was terminating my insurance, my contracts with insurance, which was the scariest thing I've done. (laughs) How many contracts was it? Uh, about five. Mm. And did you do them all at once or how did you go about that? I did them all at once. Um, Maya is it, like I said, <laughs> like Maya said, risk tolerant, yes. like very, risk very tolerant. like to a fault, <clears throat> right? Because no. I didn't have a rich plan. Uh-huh. It was enough. I've heard you and Miranda talk about this multiple times, Miranda specifically about Maybe on paper, everything feels like, oh, you don't want to do that. But in your body, Mm -hmm. I was like, I have to get off these panels. Like, I can't even tell you how clear that message was for me. And I didn't care that that meant possible loss of our entire income. I'm the sole breadwinner of my Mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. And there were quite a few oh shit moments of Mm -hmm. like, what am I doing? How could I have done this? And yet I still knew it was the right thing to do. Um, Best decision I've ever made in my practice for me personally. Mm -hmm. I I like how you just kind of slipped in the fact that you're the primary income earner. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, that's a lot of pressure. It is a lot of pressure. So you get off all the insurance panels. Do you still have a caseload? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so at that time I had um 52 clients, 50 clients. And um no one was angry. I worked myself up into a frenzy about having those conversations. I think I told mm-hmm. them March 1st and w- with the intention of being being cash pay by June 1st. Mm -hmm. Um, no one was mad. Everyone was like, that makes sense. I totally get it. There were quite a few people who needed to, needed to, and wanted to keep using their insurance. And I had this whole sort of script that I followed up with an email of you either stay with me and pay out of pocket. Um, you use your out of network benefits and I can walk you through that, or you decide insurance is the way to go for you. And I help find a person that takes your insurance Mm -hmm. and half stayed and half left. And I'll be honest with you, (laughs) Um, they were all people, the people who left, everyone was either already kind of coming to a close, their treatment was already coming to a close, 
or it was kind of not the best fit to begin with. Yeah. That's not to say the work wasn't valuable and I didn't enjoy meeting with them, but I, I could definitely tell the folks who stayed all said, you are really important to me. Mm-hmm. I need to make this investment. I will make this investment. And for that reason, I'm going to stay with you. And I still have those, most of those people on my caseload. So that was the summer of 2022. Mm-hmm. And now we are in the beginning of 2023. What does the practice look like? Oh, the practice right now runs itself. Um, I'm full, but my version of full is 14 people a week. Mm-hmm. Um, I only see clients three days a week. Mm-hmm. Day, Wednesday, Thursday. I leave Monday as like an administrative day. Mm-hmm. Where I catch up on my marketing plans, my um, like tweaking my website, dropping into the community in Zinni Me, um, you know, uh, notes, any carryover notes from the week before. And Fridays are just off. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I still have accessibility is still really important to me. So I do have like a sliding scale kind of system that I, I want to tweak and revisit. So I'm not at my total income goal, but I am, I'm comfortable. Mm-hmm. Like I no longer have that scarcity mindset that just mm-hmm. dragged me across the floor <laughs> all through that year. Yeah. Right? Like, I am working from abundance in such a big way. I know. Okay. So we've talked about how you were risk tolerant and how you don't wait. Like you don't, you just take action. Anyone who knows quickly. I am yeah. like- <laughs> How are you really able to sustain that kind of energy in your practice this entire time? No. Right. No. Well, why is that? Because life. <laughs> <laughs> right. Life, life is, um, yeah, there have been a lot of bumps in the road for me personally, and I've needed to step back. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm so thankful for what I've learned through this process of setting myself up for success and trusting my gut and right. Doing all the hard work that I did because now I can step back yeah, and, and not be so not, not make decisions based on fear, mm-hmm. but make decisions based on intuition. Mm-hmm. And Yeah. I think there's something about the energy it takes to start is not the same kind of energy to sustain. Once you have the foundation in place, the hope is that you can pull back if you need to, because it's a your business should adapt to what is happening in your life, mm-hmm. not the other way around, right? We always talk about that. So how have you talked to yourself when life has happened and, oh, this go, 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 I got this kind of energy has had to be diverted to life? and life circumstances. What is it that you tell yourself about what's happening in the business when, Hey, this is changing. My relationship with the business is changing. Yeah. It's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. That's like the first thing that just came to me when you said that, because I, I I can remember this moment. I think, I think the working session, the live working sessions and bootcamp just came Mm -hmm. to a close. That was like this huge, big, big energy, right? Like I just capitalized on that wave of energy and then stuff really hit the fan in my life. And it was this weird dynamic of like, I really want to keep doing this, but I just can't. Mm -hmm. And having I was nervous from March to June. No, from June to October, I was really nervous that I wasn't getting enough clients and I wasn't getting enough referrals. Looking back, I was doing great. I was filling up. I filled my practice in four months. And that trust, like Maya, you weren't, your gut wasn't right about that. Like your your fear was telling you all the wrong things. Like your fear and your insecurity and your scarcity mindset was telling you you're not filling up. This isn't good enough. You're not working hard enough. It was wrong. So just chill out and trust that it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. It's funny, right? How I can speak for me that a lot of my initial, like that startup culture of a business, that hustle grind is actually for me driven by anxiety and fear often. Mm -hmm. 
of like, I don't want to mess up perfectionism, um, all of that, but it cannot be sustained. And my body will let me know when it's like done with that. And um, having done, you know, Zinni me for 12 years, I was mentioning yesterday to some people about how that, that kind of cortisol <laughs> flood is gone. And there's this ease um, of learning to trust and learning to get down to what's essential. What are you finding is essential now for you in your practice? Like you can give your practice less time. You've set up a system so that you can do that, but you still have to, you still have to work. <laughs> so yeah. what, what are you discovering about what's essential to run the practice now? Um, definitely working outside of my home and having an in-person practice. Mm -hmm. That's huge for me. The, the separation between my home life and my work life. So when I'm at work, I'm really kind of focusing on work, mm -hmm. um, an organized system where I have my marketing, like I have all sort of my documents and the organization of stuff on my calendar. I have the reminders of when I check my analytics. I have the reminders of when I need to reassess my bookkeeping, you know, those kinds of things mm -hmm. and built in time for me. Mm. If I don't move my body. I'm actually stealing this from a client. If I don't move my body, I feel like garbage. Mm -hmm. That's what a client told me once. And I was like, it's true. If mm -hmm. I don't move every single day, I'm not the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing it from so many people on the podcast and like talking in the community is um, I carve out time. I'm really, really diligent about it's protected time. And that's what allows me to show up for my clients, for myself. I mean, myself first and my family and then my clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's an interesting question for people listening of, what do you define as success? Is it the 50 clients? Is it the 25 that you got down to after you got off insurance? Is it the 14 while you are faced with a lot of stress in your personal life and demands there? And you're doing the minimum, the essential of what it takes to run the business. On the outside, people have a lot of opinions about what's successful. But internally, if you own the practice, it's about what allows you to show up for yourself and others in your life, you know, and yeah. there's going to be different versions of that. Right. Before things hit the fan in your life, I'm sure what did the business, what did you think success looked like in the business versus now that things have hit the fan? What does right. success look like in the business? How do you yeah. define it, Maya? Um. Success is a, a state of being for me, right? Mm -hmm. It's like how I feel when I wake up and I think about what my day looks like. Mm -hmm. Like I wake up now and it's rare that I say, I don't want to work today. I mm -hmm. say it. I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to just like, you know, make it sound like it's all perfect and wonderful. But um, I, I love all of my clients. Like I genuinely love working with all of my clients. That's success. Mm -hmm. like, I've reached this point where I like going to work. I don't feel overwhelmed. Um, I'm proud. I have this sense of pride in what I created and what I manifested and what I've accomplished. It has nothing to do with like, even, even the number right now, like I would have been really bugged by the fact that I'm X amount of money off from my goal, my monthly goal. I'm like, that's amazing. That's cash pay. Every single person pays me cash. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that that is success. Whereas before it was how many clients, how many referrals? Let's be real. How many referrals <laughs> a month was I getting? I was like deep in that Excel sheet of mine where I was tracking mm -hmm. and like, oh, it drove me nuts. And I don't look at it anymore mm -hmm. because it's, it's not, I tied it to my worth. Mm. And that was so wrong. Yeah. That's not my worth, right? Like, and it took me a long time to start embodying that notion that my my referral rate, my landing client rate, like my conversion rate was my worth. No, mm -hmm. 
my worth is everything I've built. I'm so proud of it. Hmm. You know? I want to just, as we wrap up, go back to what you were saying about how you were praised and kind of lauded for being so busy and overworking and all of these things. What do you want to say to other clinicians that are in private practice? What message do you have for them? Don't wait. And again, I said it earlier, are you making this decision or not making this decision out of fear or out of intuition and really knowing the difference? Mm. Because I am really, I pride myself in knowing my intuition and trusting it. And that's why I move fast. Like when I'm not happy, I'm like, where's the exit? And I figure out a plan and I don't settle because I'm, I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of wavering, right? But don't wait, right? Like if so, if your body and your mind are telling you this doesn't feel right, there's something wrong with this. I don't like how this, yeah. Then it, trust that mm-hmm. and make moves, right? Because the information is out there. There's a whole community out there that is right in with you that can show you the way. Mm-hmm. Definitely. It's about running a business. What I hear you saying about running a, a private practice from an integrated place that we talk about of that. Okay. You, you have the intellectual knowledge, but then you also have the emotion of the heart, the intuition of your spirit and your body. They all work together. They all work to together. guide you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you got to stay attuned and get them connected in whatever way that looks so different for different people. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whatever way that works. What does that look like for you? Um, so I am a somatic therapist, so I drop in a lot and I track my sensate, my physical sensations as a way to guide what I'm thinking or feeling. Mm -hmm. So it's often just taking a moment to kind of be like, and where do you feel that in your body? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like where, what, and what is, if it could say something, what would it say? Mm -hmm. If it has a story, what is that story? Is it, if it's coming from someone, who's it coming from? And really just kind of like dropping level, each level down. Mm -hmm. And that's truly like a superpower that I've harnessed and feel that's the work that I do with my clients. And it's amazing. And it it works. (laughs) I love that. Well, if any of you are listening, I hope, and you resonate with Maya, that place of wanting to do well, being a primary income earner or having stuff happen in life that is taking away from your original baby of your business. I hope that you're encouraged by Maya's story. I know I am, and I've been encouraged to see you grow Mm -hmm. and to fall more in love with yourself and your gifts and honoring those and using your business as a way to honor that. Um, where can people learn more about you? Uh, I have a website, treeringcounseling.com. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't do social media yet. That's to be determined. Yeah, to be determined if what intuition says about that. <laughs> we'll check in with the body on that one for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you are inspired, if you are in the rows of building your practice or wanting to start, or you have a group practice, we are here for you. Check out all of our free stuff at zinnyme.com slash free. And we'll see you next time on the podcast. Thanks for being here, Maya. Thank you, Kelly.